All right. This morning, not this morning. Hello, brain dead. Proverbs 30. Here is the here is the main idea you're going to see tonight through the text. And I need you, if you would, help us out by helping each other pay close attention because I don't know if you realize this or not, but you do because you're smart. There is a difference between humility and arrogance. There is a difference between truly humble people and people who are arrogant, prideful. There are people who, des- who, there are people who are humble and, de- and they really desire to help other people. And there are some people who are only, their only desire is to help themselves. There are some people who are humble and, and don't mind if somebody else gets recognized. But then there are also people whose their only desire is that you only recognize them. You, sa- you have some people who are heart-filled and they have humility. And you have some people who are chest pounders asking you to only see them. I want to ask you a question tonight. By the Spirit of God in this room, I'm hoping that if you find yourself truly humble, you would thank Jesus because he's the only way we, he's the only reason we can be truly humble. But if for some reason there's a, just a twitch of arrogance and pride in you, that tonight I'm hoping the Holy Spirit would let you repent of that. Because you're going to find out in God's word from God that if you don't and you continue to live in it, it will destroy you in every relationship you come in contact. And ultimately, shh, and ultimately, an attitude like that will ultimately lead you to an eternity separated from God. And so, I'm glad you're here to hear about and understand true humility and see how incredibly wonderful it is. So, Proverbs 30, let's pray and then dive into God's word tonight so bow your heads close your eyes all over the room please don't have conversations with your neighbor while we're talking to the Lord Father tonight as we read your words words that you inspired and breathed into the writer of Proverbs 30 I pray we would not just hear this as only just good advice from somebody who's really smart but we would hear this as encouragement or possibly even a warning from a loving father who doesn't want us destroyed. (laughs) Help us, Lord, we pray. And all God's people said, Proverbs 30, spirit-led humility. This thing's going to go off every minute, I know. Spirit-led humility or chest-pounding pride. You're going to see a difference here, but let's start with Philippians 2. So I know you have Proverbs 30. Put something there to hold that spot. And then flip on over. (laughs) Get it? Philippians? Flip on over to Philippians 2. It's in the New Testament, close to the end of the Bible there. It's uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, General Electric Power Company. Yes. Philippians. So if you're at Galatians. I love it. It's like I love that. Philippians 2, shh, so here we go. Let's start, like every good thing, shh, starts with Jesus. Let's look at Philippians 2. So if you're there, say yes. So here we go. Follow along in the text of Scripture you're holding. As we read together, it says this. Let each of you look not only to his or her own interest, but also to the interest of who? Thank you. I like it when we read the word together. Then he says this. The Apostle Paul, inspired by God, so basically Jesus is speaking, God is speaking through Paul, and this is his message to us as Christians. Have this mind among yourselves. Okay. Have this mind among yourselves. When you hear this, you need to realize this is not just good advice. This is God telling every person who claims Jesus as king. Listen, well, it doesn't really matter if you claim him as king. He's king anyway. But you claim Jesus as your father, your Lord, your savior. This is literally a non-negotiable. And here it is. Have this mind among yourselves, 
which is yours in Christ Jesus, which is cool because he says, Has, have this mind, and by the way, you already have it. Just unleash it. So here it is. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped. By the way, we're talking about Jesus. Here it comes. He emptied, the Son of God emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. So King Jesus, King Son of God, the God, the creator of all things, eternal, not created, the Son of God, not created, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. God took on humanity. Put on flesh. That's what Christians, that's what we believe. That is true things. So here it goes. That's what Jesus did. And being found in human form, here's what he did. This is our example, so we have no excuse here. By being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. How obedient are we? Sometimes we're only obedient when it leads to us having a good living or a good life, but when it actually leads to suffering, we peace out. Hmm. Then you're not following the example of Christ. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a what? Not just death, like keeling over in the parking lot dead, but literally being embarrassed, crucified, bleeding out, shamed, scorned, spit upon. That's the kind of death he took. That's the kind of humility he had. Now look at this. Therefore, basically because of this, stay with us ladies, because of this, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And if you don't believe me, this is what happens at that name. So that the name of who? At the name of who? Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every, that's every single tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of who? God the Father. So here we go. Proverbs 30, you now have a perfect example of humility lived out by Jesus. Jesus being the human name of the Son of God, 100% God, and 100% humanity in one person. He named the Son of God when he put on flesh. They named him Jesus. And let me tell you what's cool. Everybody look at this. You know that the Son of God put on flesh. So the Trinity changed a little bit at the incarnation. Because the Son of God, perfect, perfectly united with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, three persons, that at incarnation, at the birth of Jesus, the Trinity changed look at this forever because you know what's amazing and also just blows my mind is that jesus today the son of god today jesus is alive with flesh seated at the right hand of god and his king of kings and for eternity you know what because he is in flesh we will be able to see him face to face for everyone who is in him. But the Bible says, God says, because he knows how it all ends out, he knows everyone who will and everyone who will not, every person will bow before Jesus. Every person will confess with their mouth that he's Lord, either in eternity with him are under his judgment in hell for eternity under him. And what's cool is, if you're breathing right now, and you are, I'm thankful because we don't have to call 911. You, if you're not in Christ, you have an opportunity to receive the free gift that this Jesus accomplished for you tonight. So, spirit-led humility. How does it look? Let's look at Proverbs 30. If you got it, go back to it. Proverbs 30, say, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. I really got to figure out how to keep this thing from going to sleep on me. Any ideas, anybody? Anybody smarter than me? It says auto lock two minutes, but it won't let me change it. I'm going to try this. I'm going to see if I just turn it off. 
All right, here we go. Spirit-led humility. Look at verses 1 through 4, chapter 30. Shh. Proverbs compiled by Solomon, wise teachings for the church. And it says this, the word of Agor, son of Jeddah. Jeddah, sorry, that's not what it is. I got May the 4th on my brain. The oracle, the man declares, I am weary. Shh. This is what the wise man declares. I am weary. I am weary, O God. I am weary, O God, and worn out. Verse 2, surely I am, look at this, I like this. I am too stupid to be a man. I have not the understanding of a man. I have not learned wisdom, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. Stay with me. Verse 4. Who has the Holy One who has ascended to the heavens and come down? Who has gathered the winds in his fist? Who has wrapped up the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Here it is. What is his name and what is his son's name? Surely you know. Now look at this. I want you to see what's happening here because humility always has a correct view of self. Focus in here. Humility, a person who is spirit-filled and humble will always have the right view of themselves. So when you read verses 1 and 4, the wise person, the one God is, basically what we're hearing is, this person has no problem saying, you know what? Look at me. This person has no problem saying they're not the greatest in the room. This person also has no problem saying, when I don't understand something, I don't act like I do. This person has no problem saying, when I don't know something, or if I miss something, I call it, I missed it. I don't know this yet. Can somebody please help? What you find is that is true wisdom and that is also true spirit-led humility as opposed to what? Somebody who will never take correction because they don't want people to think they're ever wrong. Spirit-led humility has a correct view of self. And I told you this before. I think one of the wisest, most mature thing, and this is going to sound so counterproductive, so hang with me, the most mature thing that you students can do when it comes to whether or not you know a whole bunch of stuff is to realize that, mo- that a lot of times you can get stuff wrong. Why? Because you're young. Instead of thinking you got it all together, if you, already, if you always think, okay, the Bible actually says that in the heart of a youth is bound up foolishness. And a real, truly wise teenager would say, because you know that you can be tempted to do something really foolish, you need people's help. You need godly counsel. You need, check this out, you need godly adults around you who will be willing to say, you need to stop doing that because it's foolishness. And you are more mature than you realize when you basically go, Thank you for helping me because that's true concern. So true spirit-led humility has a correct view of self. Write that down because I want to ask you a question. How do you view yourself? Do you have a hard time being corrected? If you do, then I'm glad you're here. You don't have to continue in that stupidness. You can come out of that tonight. When somebody wants to help you, you say, thanks. When somebody is correcting you, you go, whoa, thanks. Because I don't know about you, but every time as a teenager, and sometimes as an adult, I get all wound up. I forget why I am, forget what I'm saying, and somebody goes, <laughs> my wife's really good about this, because I don't know if you realize this. I can talk a lot and really fast, and the more I talk, the more I think, which gets me in trouble. And so I'll be sitting in, a, in some place, and I'll be all wound up, and my wife will lovingly just reach over and go, which means, you need to stop. <laughs> and I'll be like, because she helps me. And so having some folks in your life that love you enough to say, you are acting like a doofus, and I care more about you uh, than that. So 
Helping each other see. And by the way, if you don't have friends that correct you when you mess up, they're not your friends. They're actually your enemies. And they're really just waiting for you to destroy your life. Listen, so that they can point and laugh. I'm going to say that again. If you have friends around you who don't lovingly and con- with concern or just a little care, say, hey, dude, you need to settle that down. If, you, if your friends don't do that with you, they don't like you, they don't love you, they actually hate you. And they're just really waiting for you to blow it so bad that they can get back together and go, <laughs> Proverbs teaches you that. So, how are we doing? Okay, that just got heavy, didn't it? All right, number next. Just saying, I care enough about you to let you know. Next, spirit-led humility has a correct view of self. Spirit-led humility also has a dependence on God's word. Look at verses 5 and 6. Stay with me. Back, put your head back down in the Bible. Let's read the word. Spirit-led humility has a dependence on God's word. You don't just take your own view. You say, God, you tell me something in your word, help me to obey it. Look at verse uh, 5 and 6. Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. In other words, following God's word will protect you from a whole heap of trouble. Look at verse 6. And... He has such a good view of the word, he would never consider this. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. God's word is so true and so good and so beneficial when you hear it spoke. Like right now, many of you in this room, because you're listening for God's word, you just heard God speak to you and tell you some incredible things about the course of your life right now. And some of you, by the Spirit of God, are going to be able to obey that, and you can literally say, God, thank you for telling me that, because that right there is probably the answer to some of your troubles with your parents, your friends, your teachers, and you're like, oh, dude, yeah. So the next time you say, when's the last time you heard God speak? You can say about five minutes ago at Tribe when we were reading his word, because he talks all the time, by the way. So you with me? So chapter 35 and 6, spirit-led humility has a dependence on God's word. Do you? Do you depend on God's word? Or maybe I want to ask you this question. Maybe you need to write this question down. Whose word do you depend on the most? If it's not God's word. Is it a person that you're in class with? Is it a is it a person on social media that you follow that really is really popular now? I don't know. I just don't know. Who, who is it? Because you, because everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. I know it's hot and you're doing great. Stay with me. You are following somebody's word. Listen, you are following somebody's word. You are following somebody's truth. Somebody is teaching you. And sometimes I can, I can determine who it is based on how you act, you dressed, you talk. I can see it. How you treat others. I can say, whoa, I think you're more in line with this person than the word of God. So spirit-led humility has a, big word, dependence on God's word, which is also why we encourage you, a person who depends on God's word, God's word wants, listen, wants to be in a place where God's word is taught. You would rather be in a place where God's word is taught than in a place where just you have a good time and you do some fun stuff and somebody just says the name of Jesus and then sends you home. You say, man, teach me the word. So five five and six, spirit-led humility has a dependence on God's word. Now, speaking of that, remember when it said don't add to the word? Let me give you an example when adding to the word destroyed everything. This is how big of a deal it is. Stay with me. When not listening and adding to God's word literally, literally destroyed humanity for for, for a long time. Genesis 3, 1 through 6. Here it is. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of the tree in the garden? So the serpent tempted Eve to question God's word. Mmm, happens. 
Look at this. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Look at this. But God said, this is what the woman said to the serpent, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. And then look how she added to it. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then look what the serpent added. Serpent said, well, look at this. You will not surely die. So the serpent comes in and tempts Eve to do this, look, to question God's word. Students, I'm going to give you the cheat codes to life. That is the sin that every single one of us are tempted with every single day. You're probably going, what do you mean? I didn't, I'm not eating any fruit. When you know God says to do this and live this way, but yet you do it another way, what you've done is you have followed, you have followed the lie of the serpent who said, I know you know God said this, but you know if you just do this, you'll get away with it, and you might actually have more fun. It's the same voice, and we keep falling for it over and over and over and over and over and over again. I know what he says about your parents, but, you know, God doesn't realize how your parents just don't understand. So just you can get away with it over and over and over the same it's the same thing and then he says this for god knows that when you eat of your if you eat of it your eyes will be open look at how he's adding the scripture and you will be like god knowing good and evil so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was in the tree was to be desired to be made wise she took the fruit and she ate it. And then she did this. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. Eve was deceived. Adam just flat out rebelled. And from that moment on, listen, look at me. You want to know how big of a deal that is? Listen, listen. Let me tell you how big of a deal it is when you don't listen to God's word and you add to God's word and you take away from God's word. Let me tell you how big of a deal it is. That is why you and I are conceived and born with a sin nature because of that. That is why every single person who is born and breathes and is alive from the womb all over, they literally deserve hell because you've sinned against God from the beginning because they're born in sin. Why? Because of the sin of our first parents, Adam and Eve. So would you say God's word is a pretty big deal? That's why I have to tell you, a humble person, a spirit-led humble person, this, this remote thing's going to drive me nuts. Wait, I think I have the clicker. Yes, I'll just use it. Is that okay? Y'all okay if I do that? Going back old school. Yes, old school, baby. Thank you, Apple products. Next, spirit-led humility does this. Ask the Lord for help. Look at verse 7. You guys are doing good. Hang with me. Spirit-led humility. Also, how you doing so far? How you doing so far on the humble meter? Maybe if you're not, that's okay. I'm glad you're here. You don't have to continue. If the Lord's showing you, you need some help with it. It's probably a reason he has you here tonight. Shh. I'm not surprised. It's, it's probably a reason you are here tonight if you're realizing that some of these things you've got to start working on. Spirit-led humility. Ask the Lord for help. Look at 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you. Here we go. Shh, 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 shh. Deny them not to me before I die. Look at the question. Look at the request. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. It's a good request. Probably because he knows, like we are, we're tempted to lie. Because we think that the truth is not worth it. Shh. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me 
with the food that is needful for me. I like this. He's asking God to not make him too poor, but also not make him too rich. And give him enough food that he just needs. Look at what he says. And he's so, he's so humble. He's so self-aware. And I'm hoping you are too because he says this. Look. Look at this in verse 9. Lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. So basically he's saying, he is so, this man, the wisdom God is teaching us is, do you desire God so much that you don't want to be tempted by poverty or riches because those may turn you away from God? Seriously, when's the last time you said, God, I am so in love and so want to follow you and live for you that I, I don't want to be too wealthy. I don't want to be too poor. I don't want to be too, I want to be content in you because I don't want anything to distract me from following you. When's the last time we prayed that? It's a good prayer because a spirit-led humility asked the Lord for this, help. When's the last time we said, God, I need your help? I mean, seriously, write it down if you can remember the exact time, the last time. I asked you another question a couple weeks ago. The last time you literally stopped and said, Jesus, I need your help here. I don't understand this. This is crazy. I need your help. When's the last time we did that? You know you can do that all the time. A couple weeks ago, I asked you, when's the last time you remember repenting of sin in your life. So, spirit-led humility, ask the Lord for help. Ask the Lord for help. One of the things I do when people come up and say, ah, I need some help or whatever, I say, have you talked to the Lord about it yet? Because sometimes we are quicker to go to a person for help before we ever talk to the Lord. Why is that? Good question. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Let's think about it. Next. Chest pounding pride and arrogance. Oh, it goes on. It basically turns from a, a spirit of humility to uh, that old chest pounding arrogant look at what I did moment. <laughs> Which, by the way, sadly is applauded in the world today. Sadly. Chest pounding pride and arrogance uses people to get ahead. Shh. Uses people to get ahead. Uses people for a, to accomplish something. Chest pounding arrogance and pride will use people to get something. They don't love and care for people. They're only using people. So look at verse 10. It says here, do not slander a servant to his master. In other words, a servant to his masters means you're trying to lie against a person that you're working with so that you will get the promotion. Lest he curse you and you be held guilty. Chest pounding pride uses people to get ahead. They'll lie about people. They'll talk about people. They will gossip about people because it'll give them more popularity. They will, hey, they'll even have a friend because it makes them more popular. That is an arrogant spirit that will destroy you and people around you. Chest pounding pride and arrogance uses people to get ahead. Question, if you are guilty of this and the Lord has revealed it to you, I'm glad you're here. You can repent of that tonight and not have to continue in it. And look at me, you can have courage to go to that person and say, you know what I've realized tonight? I haven't been a good friend. Can you forgive me? And tell them you're sorry. And tell them why. Because by telling them why, that'll be preaching the gospel to them. Seriously. Look at the next one. Chest pounding pride and arrogance scorns parents' instructions. Every student who is ultimately arrogant and prideful usually don't pay attention to their parents' instructions. 
or at least the parents' instructions who are in the Lord. Seriously, look at verse 11. It says, there are those who curse their fathers, basically say, I can't believe, blah, 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 basically, and cuss their father out. And they do not bless their mother. So there are those who curse their fathers, which basically means what you're supposed to do with your fathers, or you're supposed to bless them, not curse them. And those who do not bless their mothers, instead of blessing your mom, you curse your mom. You treat your mom like she's property instead of a treasure to you. That's pride and arrogance. It scorns parents' instructions. How do you do when it comes to your parents? Okay, look at me real quick. You know this. We do this because this is like the main relationship in your life. Cheat codes to life. If you can start tonight obeying God when it comes to your relationship with your parents, listen, I promise you, life will make more sense and there will be a lot more joy, peace, and prosperity in your future. You know how I know that? Because God said it. So what is there tonight when it comes between you and your parents or those who care for you directly where you need to work on that relationship? Greatest thing my son ever did to me was come in one day and say, Dad, I need to tell you this thing. Can you forgive me? And you know what I did instantly? Absolutely. Some of you might do that tonight. Maybe some of you have just been at odds with your parents. You can't get along any, it, for any reason. And it's like, it, they'll say something and you'll disagree. And you don't even know why you're disagreeing. And you're like, I don't even know why I'm disagreeing. I'm just going to disagree. Oh, I don't like it. Oh, I don't want to get up early. No, I don't want to clean my room. Get off my back. Leave me alone. Boom. Literally tonight, you can set your parents free by walking in and saying, I'm sorry. Can you forgive me for doing this? And in the process, look, you will be set free. I'm looking around the room. Some of you get it. Some of you are still holding on those chains. I hope not. Maybe tonight you'll let it go. Because chest-pounding pride scorns their parents' instruction. Look at the next one. Chest-pounding pride never sees his or her own issues. It's always some... (laughs) Chest-pounding pride always sees that it's somebody else's what? Fault. Problem. It's not my problem. It's... Your problem. It's not my fault. It's, I know I went crazy and I went all nuts on them, but they made me mad. If that has ever, (laughs) that has come out of my mouth, so I'm going to confess. If that's ever come out of your mouth, you are guilty of this section of Scripture. If you've ever said, they made me mad, you never saw your own issue. It's always somebody else. I'm saying in the room, if your anger issue is always somebody else's fault, you need to repent and ask the Lord to help you own your issue. Because if you don't, listen, you will never be free of it. Look at verse 12 and 13. Here it is. There are those who are clean in their own eyes like everybody else can see it but them, but are not washed of their filth. There are those, how lofty are their eyes, how high are their eyelids lifted, or how high their eyelids lift. Chest pounding pride, arrogance always sees it as somebody else's fault. Next, last one. Chest pounding pride and arrogance uses less fortunate people for their own advantage. They come into a room and they say they can take advantage of and they take advantage of them. It's basically walking in, seeing a person who's struggling and not helping, but just shoving them over. Some people call them bullies. By the way, can I let you in a little secret? Bullies are the most sad people internally. Most of them have issues themselves. You know this. You've been told this a million times. But, Chest pounding pride and arrogance, these people look in and they look to use less fortunate people to their own advantage. Look at verse 14. There's so much here. It's like, man, it's like God wrote this book. Oh, he did. Look at verse 14. There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are, hang on, 
are knives. Look at what they do. Shh. This is what this person, a prideful, this is what we do when we're prideful and arrogant in this area. We devour the poor from off the earth, the needy from among mankind. Wow. Last, chest pounding pride and arrogant people are never satisfied. Oh, sorry, I know I'm in some of our lunch boxes today. I'm like, oh, just getting around and meddling. Chest pounding pride is marked by this attitude I need more. I need the new thing. So and so has the new thing. I need more. You get it. You're like, play with it for five months or a month. I need the new thing. I need this. I need this. I need this. I want this. How come I can't have this? Why does everybody else have cool stuff, but I don't have cool stuff? Why can't I do this? Why? By the way, shh, shh, that personality trait. See, let me, okay. I know what's happening in the room, so listen close. Shh. A couple weeks ago, I revealed this to you and confessed this to you. The reason some of you in this room don't want to hear this is because the enemy has you in his teeth and he doesn't want to let you go. And he's really, he's working the temp. I mean, like literally, he's made, there's like, a, there's like sin nature that goes, it's really hot in here, so don't pay attention. Oh man, so-and-so's goofy. I know, but ha, ha, ha. And so literally the enemy's schemes happening in the room because there's a supernatural thing happening when you hear the word of God. So the enemy scheme is to say, you don't need to listen to this. There's something else more important going on. Why? Because you're caught up in it and the enemy doesn't want to give you up. Question is, are you that that you don't see it? And some of you are encouraging your friend not to hear it and they're in the midst of it. And let me tell you, I'm not getting on your case. I love you enough and care about you enough and want to teach the word and want you to teach the word in such a way that you recognize when you teach the Bible, you are doing spiritual warfare because the word of God is powerful to change hearts. That's why the enemy doesn't want you to hear it and listen because it will change everything. And the enemy wants you to stay the same. It's that. And I'm glad you're here to hear it. I'm glad you're here even to hear what the enemy's up to so you know it. Because chest-pounding arrogance is never satisfied. Are you satisfied? Content? Write this word down, contentment. A Christian who is, has everything they need in Jesus is content with what they have in Jesus. Now, 17 to 31, you can take it back on your, to yourself, to your room tonight, and study this. These are observations of the humble. Humby. <laughs> I forgot an L. Ha! I'm ridiculous. Sorry, I'm ridiculous. Observation of the humby. That's that car you can drive. Humby is what, uh, humby's what Sam and them raised to make honey bee. It's awesome. Honey's good. All right. So how do we do it? This is a word to the recovering fool. Shh. To the person who's recovering from foolishness, this is a good word for you. You ready? By the way, wise people, humble people, you listen because tomorrow you can start acting stupid. Why? Because you know you can. Because you know you're not perfect. So here's the word for the recovering fool. Here it is. I like this. And then we're going to celebrate and worship and respond. Shh. If you have been foolish, you know, exalting yourself, or if you have been devising evil, that's what fools do, what prideful, chest-pounding people do. Look at what it says. Put your hand on your mouth. Basically, <laughs> If you've been foolish, exalting yourself, if you have been devising evil, basically stop. Wow. Everybody say wow. Wow. Okay. Shh. So I know what you're saying. Let's get ready. Shh. I know what you're saying. You might be saying, Steve, I think for some crazy reason, 
I feel like I'm kind of more in the arrogant pride. What do I do? What do I do? The answer is stop it. You can write that down and share that. (laughs) How do you stop being prideful and arrogant and foolish? How do you do it? You just stop. Thank you, Tyler. It is. So bow your heads. Close your eyes. As Rachel comes on up, we're going to prepare our hearts and our minds to be thankful for what God has done through Jesus as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, as we uh, celebrate taking up and giving uh, offering tonight. Uh, So bow your head. Close your eyes. If you're in the room tonight and you've heard about true humility in Jesus, and you've heard about foolishness and arrogance. And tonight you might be thinking, how do, I, how, do I, how do I deal with this? If you don't know Christ, you cannot. If you don't know Christ, you will only be bent to be arrogant and prideful. That's all you're, even if you're really sweet and kind, you'll find there's always a prideful arrogance about it. The only answer and solution to the sinfulness of arrogance and pride is a relationship with Jesus Christ. 